Amen. Joshua is nearly 110 years old when he, when he gives this farewell address. 110 years old. Uh, this would be very similar to, his, to a last will and testament. Uh, if there was something that you were wanting to tell uh, your family or your children, your grandchildren, and you wrote everything out, these are the last words of wisdom, the last words of direction I want to give. That was what Joshua was doing in the verses that we've looked at. He summoned the Israelites to a place called Shechem. If you notice that in verse uh, number 1, we read over that quickly oftentimes. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. Now Shechem was an interesting place. It was a very important spiritual place for the people of Israel. We read over it quickly. It doesn't make any significant uh, significance to us. But the children of Israel, Shechem was a very important place. In fact, it was the first place where Abram arrived when God told him to get out of his country in Genesis 12. Shechem was a place where God promised the land to Abraham uh, in verse 7 of chapter 12 of Genesis. Shechem was a place where Joseph wanted his bones to come to rest in Genesis chapter 15. Uh, Shechem was a place where Moses commanded an altar to be built, and the words of the law were written out so that they would be remembered in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Shechem was a place where Moses commanded the blessings and the curses to be spoken aloud in Deuteronomy 27. It was a place where Joshua took the people to hear the reading of the law when he began to lead them in Joshua chapter 8. This is generally believed to be the place where Jesus met the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well and told her, God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It was this place to which Joshua brings all the children of Israel back together to give them this last commission, this last will and testament, uh, this last word of direction for them. The gravity of this final message uh, was, uh, was nailed down by the location that he was to give the address. It would be much, much like uh, maybe a, a president or some a political leader going to some real distinguished or maybe a Arlington Cemetery or, or some battlefield somewhere on the steps of, uh, of uh, uh, some monument or something. Some very sacred place and the words are spoken from that place. Uh, as as uh, Lincoln's um, address there is, is uh, uh, there in, in, in Washington, uh, D.C., as uh, he stood and gave those great words. And so the, the importance of this event was vital, not just because of what was about to be said, but the location, what it represented, the symbolization of that. Uh, maybe it's like going back to the place where you got saved. Um, uh, maybe it's going back to the, the, the house uh, that you lived in when someone knocked on your door. And you just sort of reflect a little bit and say, this is where I lived when I got saved. And a bus, bus captain came by, a bus worker came by and knocked on my door. And, or this is where I lived, where someone from the church came by and invited me to church. Or this is where I was when I knelt and trusted Christ as my Savior. So the Israelites, Shechem was a very sacred place. This was a fitting place to encourage the Israelites to make God number one in their lives. Because it was at this place uh, in Shechem that their forefather, Jacob, had buried the idols that his family had brought with them from Uncle Laban. Uh, you remember that story, we won't go into detail, but uh, they had taken some of those uh, idols, some of those images, and they had, they had uh, taken them with them that was against God's plan, and, and uh, Jacob found out about it, and uh, Jacob made sure that those idols or those images were buried in Shechem. This was Jacob's way of helping his family make a clean break from their idolatrous past. And now Joshua, the leader of Israel, stood at the same spot, the same location, to try to renew the passion, the, 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 the desire, and, and the willingness for these people at this generation to do something great for God and to put God first in their lives. To put God first. They get to Shechem. It wouldn't have been easy. It's not like you and I 
uh, getting in a vehicle and, and uh, getting on the road and, and being there in 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, uh, no uh, inconvenience on our part. It would have taken a lot of work, a lot of effort for all of Israel all over that land to assemble at this place in Shechem. Also consider how busy they must have been. Uh, they had just moved into Canaan. There were houses to build. There were crops to plant. Uh, there were battles that still needed to be fought. Uh, and uh, since all the Canaanites had not been yet driven away. And so the temptation would have been to skip Joshua's farewell speech. And if you're like, you know, we know what Joshua stands for. We've uh, been under his ministry. We've heard him preach many times. But they came. They all came. And I'm sure it, it very much um, excited Joshua as he looked out and saw the thousands upon thousands of Israelites all assembled to hear an old man, 110 years old, give that final farewell, that final address to the people that he loved so dearly. Joshua knew that their presence alone did not mean that they were devoted to the Lord. They had all assembled, but just because they were there doesn't mean they were there. Just because they were attending that event doesn't mean their heart was committed and devoted to serving God. Just like us today, uh, we're here, uh, but your presence here tonight is not proof that you're devoted to God. And that uh, your presence here, and we're glad you're here uh, today and tonight as we gather, but your, you being here doesn't show the dedication and commitment and passion that you have for God. The Israelites were notoriously fickle when it came to their service to God. Remember how quickly they turned their back on the promise to obey God at the, the foot of Mount Sinai? Just 40 days after they made a promise and a vow to God that they would obey God, 40 days you find them taking the gold, making a golden calf, and bowing down and worshiping just 40 days, they had turned away from their commitment and vow to serve God. I wonder in our lives, uh, as we look at our lives, I wonder how long does it take for our minds to wander uh, when we come to church? Is it 40 minutes or uh, is it 40 seconds? Or I wonder how long it takes for our lives to wander. You make a decision at the altar and uh, you're excited, passionate. You walk out the doors, but how many miles do we drive and how long does it take before we lose that passion for God? And so we see then that we ought to pay close attention to what Joshua is going to say to the Israelites because it has a lot to do with us as well. Uh, because we're also we're a fickle people. Uh, we also uh, are not uh, all that we would like uh, to, to others to think of us that we are. We're not always that type of an individual. Joshua challenges the whole nation. He forces them to make a decision. And it's very important because the choice they make on this day will determine their life future. And choices you and I make on a daily basis that we seem so insignificant, so trivial, so unimportant, it has a life impact on their life choices uh, that we make at the crossroads of life. And so whatever their choice, we read in the story that Joshua already made it clear to these people, he's already made his choice up. It doesn't matter what they choose. He's already decided. Now, he'd like them to choose what he's chosen, to follow God, but he's already decided in his heart. They may not follow God. Uh, their presence here is, is great. I'm glad the crowds gathered at Shechem. This is a spiritual crossroad. The potential here is something great for the cause of Christ. <clears throat> but I've already made my choice whether you serve God or not. And so Joshua had already made that. His mind was already settled. No matter what the rest of the people decided, when he challenged them to choose you this day, whom you'll serve, Joshua was determined to follow God. But what, what did God, and we've seen this verse so many times. Choose this day whom you'll serve. And, uh, but for me and my house, we've seen that verse. We've heard it preached. But wait a minute. Let's go back to this place, Shechem, and let's look at what Joshua was truly uh, asking of them to do. Uh, and Joshua uh, is asking them, what did it mean for them to choose you this day to serve God? What was that choice uh, entailing? Uh, what was the uh, all-encompassing part of, yes, I'll make the choice. Count me in, preacher. I'm in. Yes, I'm in all the way. But wait a minute. What did the choice mean? 
The people of Israel, they knew God through Joshua told them. What was Joshua challenging the people to do? Challenge given, challenge accepted. Tonight, I want to give you the same challenge that Joshua gave to uh, those people on that day. Joshua uh, had already decided what he's going to do. I, like Joshua, have already decided what I'm going to do. I've decided a long time ago that I'm choosing this day to serve the Lord. And uh, But for me and my house, we're going to serve God. We're going to do right. We're going to go in the right direction and serve God. And so as we look at your life today, as we represented ourselves uh, in those people of Israel in the land of Shechem, what was it that he challenged them to do? Now let's, let's see what he exactly uh, stresses in these verses. He says, now therefore, in verse number uh, 14, he says, now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil to serve the Lord, choose you this day. So he says, all right, I'm telling you what it means to serve God. We have the idea that serving God is a bunch of things that we do, a bunch of activities that we do. And uh, yes, count me in, I'm serving God. But God tells us clearly and gives us a challenge of what is it, what is Joshua challenging the people to do? What does it include to serve God? Well, first thing I want you to notice, and God outlines it for us very clearly uh, in this one verse, the message for tonight. First thing God says, if you want to choose to serve God, the first thing you've got to do you got to fear the Lord. Part of serving God is fearing the Lord. you got to fear God. Uh, Joshua stresses the importance of fearing God. It's the first item that's listed in Joshua's challenge to the people. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is foundational. It's a very basis that, that all your life and that all my life is based upon. But the beginning of what? Wisdom is to fear God. If you want to serve God, God says you better understand it's a fear of God. If you don't have fear for God, you won't be able to serve God. If you have no fear of God, then you don't know what it is to choose to serve God. He says, so listen, the challenge here is fear God, fear the Lord. And God says if you choose to fear the Lord, here's what it means. Several ideas that he gives us in fearing God. Take your Bibles, and we'll keep a marker here in Joshua. But take your Bibles and go to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, and uh, let me give you a verse in verse number 13, what it means to fear the Lord, what it means to fear God, Uh, and uh, as we look at this thing of, here's a challenge, challenge, you want to serve God? Before you count the cost, uh, before you make the choice, you better understand what the criteria is. You better understand what God's expecting. You better understand what God is laying out for you, and the first thing he says is what? You better fear the Lord. Bear fear the Lord your God. Uh, in Ecclesiastes 12, look at verse number 13. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon had everything. He had everything that man, uh, mankind would think would be necessary to find fulfillment and happiness in life. But yet he summarized his entire life in these, this verse. He says, here's a conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So fearing the Lord is always connected with obedience. You will not obey God if you do not fear God. God says through Solomon, uh, he says here in in, uh, Ecclesiastes, he says let's summarize all of life and, and let's narrow it down and come to a conclusion. Here's what all that matters in life. Fear God and keep his commandment. Fear God and keep his commandment. Fear God and keep his commandment. This is a whole duty. All that's expected is fear God and keep his commandment. So if we're going to serve God, God says you better fear the Lord. What's that mean? It's tied to keeping the commandments of God. If you don't keep the commandments of God, you don't have a fear of the Lord. Those that obey God, to the extent you obey God, is the extent that you and I fear God. The beginning of wisdom is a fear of God. The beginning of wisdom is a fear of God. And if there's no fear of God, there's no motivation on our part to follow and obey God. The only way we'll serve God acceptably in Romans 12, 28, the Bible says, is with reverence 
and godly fear. Flip over to that. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 28. You say, preacher, I want to serve God uh, with my life. I want God to, to make a difference with my life. I want to impact uh, the world for the cause of Christ. Choose you this day. I want to serve God. What's it require? What's the stipulation? Fear God. Here's it is. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, verse and number 28, the Bible says, Wherefore, we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. All right, there's an unacceptable way to serve God. The acceptable way to serve God is what? With reverence and godly fear. You want to fear God? You want to serve God? Then God says, Joshua says to the people, Challenge given. Will we accept the challenge? Fear God. Also, fearing God is not just connected with obedience, but fearing God is also connected. You're in Hebrews there. Go to um, um, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, verse number 31. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 31, we see what else the fearing of God includes if we're going to serve God. It says in 31 chapter 10, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Uh, we have so deluded God, and we have so much brought God down to our level and down to our plane that we've lost all godly fear of who God is, the greatness of God we saw a little bit this morning, the magnificence of God, the power of God, the awesomeness of God, and we flippantly shake our fist at that holy God, and we despise that holy God and deny and reject that holy God and snub that holy God and wonder why we don't have the blessings of God on our lives because God says we've got to uh, fear God. The Bible says in this verse, it's fearful to fall in to the hands of a living God. So I say, firstly, fear of God is connected with obedience. But secondly, fearing God also means we must recognize God's ability and willingness to to destroy the disobedience. God's no respecter of persons. God, you don't play games with God. And uh, yes, God is long-suffering. And yes, God is loving. And yes, God is kind. But God's also righteous. God's holy. And God's just. And God will not allow us to continue on our path, doing our will, and not have consequences that come. It's fearful to fall in the hands of God. He says in Matthew, Jesus says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him that's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Listen, the fear of God is why you got saved. The fear of God is why you're going to serve God. The fear of God is why you're going to stay right in serving God. Because if you want to choose, choose you this day. Yes, I count me in. Hold it. Before you make the choice, before you make the decision, I want you to understand what it entails to serve God. Joshua says, you got to fear the Lord. you got to fear the Lord. And uh, because if you allow the fear of man to dictate what you do, then you'll be, be compromised and you'll be back and forth. And uh, you can't appease everybody. You can't please everybody. If you allow the fear of your circumstances to cause you to make decisions or not make decisions, then that's going to go. We need some men of God. We need some women of God, Joshua says. We need some. I've chosen to choose me this day. I'm going to serve God. But we need some men and women and young people that says, yes, I'll serve God and fear God in choosing to serve God. So we obey. Obey God with fear of the Lord. We recognize God's ability to judge us because of the fear of God. And uh, let me give you one other. Go to Psalm 33 and verse number 8 as we look at the fear of God. Most folks like to look at this last part of the fear of God. It's one dimension of God's fear, but it's not all inclusive of what the fear of God is all about. Psalm 33, look what it says beginning in verse number 8 down through verse number 11. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the earth fear. Fear the Lord. That's saved, unsaved. That's believers, unbelievers. Uh, and uh, God said, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to not. He maketh the device of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord stand forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. So the fear of God is connected to obedience. The fear of God is connected to God's judgment. When we disobey God, but the fear of God is also, as the Bible says, is a reverence and awe. Of God, see that verse says it says let all the fear, let all the earth fear God, fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world do what stand in awe. Wow, what an awesome God! 
And so part of fearing God is, yes, a respect for God. It's an awe of God. And most would like to define the fear of God as just that. The fear of God is just respecting God, just recognizing who God is, and He's an awesome God. And He is an awesome. We learned a little bit about that this morning, but it's also understanding it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. And uh, you choose to go your own path away from God. You're putting yourself outside of God's hedge of protection. You're taking yourself out, God, outside of God's uh, area to protect and guide and direct your life. And listen, when you don't walk with God and you don't serve God and you don't obey God, then you're putting yourself in a very fearful position. That's what it is to choose to serve God. Yes, I'll serve God. But part of choosing that decision is will you fear God? Will you fear God? But then it goes on to say, all right, go back to Joshua again. And as we look at our verse here in Joshua 24, and as we look at the story that's given here, he says, all right, he says, now, therefore, all right, verse 15, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. All right, we love that. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We love that. We hear it preach all the time. But when's the last time you heard of the requirements before you make that choice? When's the last time you heard of the, the ingredients that are necessary to be a part of that choice versus, yes, count me in. Hold it. Might want to think about that choice first. It includes fearing God. But let's read on the next thought. It says, that now therefore fear the Lord. And then it says, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. It's the same Similar statement that Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John 4, when he says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, to please God, to please God, we need two things. You need the right attitude, and you need the right actions. If you're going to make the choice to choose you this day whom you're going to serve, you've got to fear the Lord, number one. First and foremost, you have no fear of God, then that you're not, you're not fit to be a part of the fellowship of God. He said, listen, I need those who aren't afraid of, of people. I need those who are not afraid of life situation. I need those who are fearful of God. And then he says, I need those who will serve me in sincerity and in truth. I want those that have the right attitude and the right actions. To serve the Lord in sincerity means this. You have to have the right motivation for serving God. You see, we can't be like the Pharisees who merely work to appear righteous before others. That's what hypocrisy is all about. Uh, any of us, and we're experts at it, uh, we all do it quite well. Uh, we can do on the outside to give the appearance, uh, to give the impression uh, to others how uh, righteous and holy and committed and passionate and desirous we are serving God. And God said, I want you to serve me in sincerity. Uh, you know, I can't judge your sincerity, but God can. You can tell me you're sincere, but, but, and I'll take it at face value, uh, but you telling me you're sincere or me telling you I'm sincere uh, doesn't make me any or less more sincere or less sincere. God knows the sincerity, the, the attitude of my heart. God said, I want you to serve me with the right attitude. We must not be like those Pharisees. One can be wicked but appear to be righteous. Some of the most ungodly people are some of the most self-righteous people that they appear to be on the outside. The Bible calls them as uh, wolves in sheep clothing. Wolves in sheep clothing. They show up and they look spiritual on the outside, but their attitude's not there. Their heart's not there. They're going through the motions, but there's no passion. There's no desire. There's no love. There's no uh, 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 fire for the things of God. And so God said, I want you to serve me. Now, before you say, choose you this day, what's the a, what's a stipulation, Joshua? What are the, what are the requirements? Uh, what's expected of me if I'm going to say, yes, I'm choosing with you, Joshua, to serve God? Then number one, number one, you've got to fear God. Number two, you've got to, the service you do for God is got to be done out of sincerity. It's got to be done out of sincerity, and that your heart has to be right uh, with God. You see, our motivation to serve God must simply be based upon the fact that God's worthy of our service. He's worthy. You're here tonight, hopefully, because God's worthy of you being here. Not me and, and not each other, but God's worthy. That's why you're here today. You read your Bible throughout the week because God's worthy uh, for you to spend time with Him during the week. And you spend time in prayer because He's worthy to be uh, in His presence with Him. And so Paul describes uh, this type of uh, behavior as we look at uh, this uh, service to God. He says, I want you to serve in sincerity. But then he says, I want you to serve the Lord in what? Truth. I want you to serve the Lord in truth. Uh, this means you've got to serve God 
his way and not your way. Don't convince God that you know how to serve him. He's already told you how he wants to be served. Well, I'll do this, and that will really make God happy. No, God's already told you how to, to serve him. And uh, how many times you look in the Bible, and they did some, well, I, well you know, what are the bleeding of the sheep, and what's the noise that I hear? And, oh, I'm going to bring that back for sacrifice, and, and we're going to use that to, to honor God and worship God for giving us victory over the battle. And uh, uh, he rebukes and listen, God is not pleased in, in sacrifice. God is much more honored by obedience. God wants to obey. He said, wipe them out. Destroy them. I don't care what your intention is, even if it's it's a good, uh, we're going to use it for God. We're going to use it to sacrifice God. You don't worship God your way. You worship God God's way. And so we're creating today in our culture, within our churches, we're creating ways in which we think God would like us to worship him in ways that we think God is pleased with how we're worshiping him and we're not worshiping him in truth. And so truth is worshiping God, serving God in the way that God wants to serve him. You cannot do whatever you want to do in the service to God and expect him to be pleased with you. I'm glad for all the social work you're doing, but if souls are still dying and going to hell, you can feed all the folks you want. You can, you can uh, put roofs over folks all you want. You can put them in uh, hotels all you want. But if folks are still dying and going to hell, our job has to be the main thing. And let's not allow the good things and how we're trying to serve God to dictate the main thing. God says, you want to serve me? Here's how I want you to serve me. Just do what I've told you to do. Don't add any, any in between there, uh, in between the lies. And Paul describes this type of worship in uh, Colossians chapter uh, 2. Let's go over to Colossians uh, chapter number 2. And uh, let me show you uh, exactly what God is teaching us here, that you can't worship God uh, the way you want to worship. Well, uh, we're just going to go to the mountains and worship God on Sunday. Uh, that may sound spiritual. That may pacify your conscience. That may make you feel like you're all okay and uh, right with God. God, but when God says on Sunday is the Lord's day and don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together as a matter of some is and when the house of the Lord is open and you're not here then I don't care what you're doing I don't care how many Bibles you're reading I don't care how much uh, Bible you're reading or how many verses you're memorizing or how many things you're doing for God if you're not in church when church is open that kind of worship doesn't please God it doesn't honor God. Why? God's already told us what to do. Well, we'll be, we'll be with you in spirit, preacher. Don't bring your spirit here. Uh, keep it where you're at, all right? I want your body here, and I want you here. And God says when you worship God, then I want you to be where God wants you to be and uh, serving God. Okay, Colossians chapter number 2, and uh, look what God says here as uh, we look at the importance of worshiping God his way, not our way. Colossians chapter 2. Here it is, uh, verse number 23. Bible says, With things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility. So notice that word there, show, S-H-E. So it gives the appearance. It gives the, the idea, the impression, uh, a show of what? Wisdom in what? Will worship. You're deciding how to worship God. You're deciding how to, how to honor God. You're deciding how, how God wants to be pleased. You're doing it in a show of wisdom, in will worship, and humility. But notice what it says, but neglecting of the body. What's the body? We're the body. It's church. This is a great verse to say, I don't care what you're doing on a mountaintop. I don't care what you're doing uh, out and about in God's nature. He says you're doing nothing to honor the body and not in honor to what? To the satisfying of the flesh. God says, listen, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're trying to do right. I'm glad you're trying to do the best you can do. But I've told you what to do. And if you don't do it, what you're doing, no matter how good it is, it doesn't honor me. You either obey or you don't obey. It's either right or it's wrong. Uh, there's no, it's either hot or cold. Uh, it's not lukewarm as God says. Uh, and then look down, uh, if you would, uh, in uh, Colossians chapter 3, in verse number 17, he tells you how he wants us to worship him and whatsoever you do in, in word and deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Uh, you can't thank God by doing something your way. You can only thank God by doing something his way. And so God says, I want you to worship me, ser serve me in what? Sincerity, have the right attitude. Don't, be, don't, don't have that wrong attitude, wrong spirit, but also he said, I want you to serve the right action. Don't you decide. 
That's what they did when they made the golden calf. They figured out, well, God will really like this, and uh, it won't be that bad, and, and we're going to use it in a good way. Listen, you don't take the world stuff and use it in a good way and justify something that it's not in compliance and uh, conform to what God would have us to do. So God said, I want you to fear God. I want you to serve God uh, with um, sincerity and in truth, that fear of God as we come before God with a sincere heart to desire to serve Him as only God desires to be served from us. Now go back to Joshua again, and uh, let's look on and to uh, see what God says as He continues uh, this song. And so God wants to be uh, pleased with our lives, but is He pleased with how we're living our life? Notice in Romans chapter, before we go to Joshua, I want you to go real quick to uh, J- uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're getting ready uh, next week. To, uh, to get everyone tied in and serving and involved in ministry within the body of Christ here at the Lighthouse Baptist Church. And uh, let me give you a verse here that's going to help us as we talk about serving God in sincerity and in truth. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. The Bible says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. I want you to look at that first word, the word slothful. Jesus used the same word about the lazy servant that buried the treasure, the talents that were given to him. And he says, thou wicked and slothful, thou unprofitable and slothful servant. He says you should have at least gotten some interest of it. And you should have done something with the talents and abilities. And that's the same word that's used there. He just buried it in the ground until the master showed up. The lazy servant put his own convenience above the master's purpose. It's the same word used in Proverbs chapter 6 to describe the sluggard who needs to go to the ant and consider the hard work and storing up food for the summer and for winter and all that. And so I ask you, do you work hard at serving God? Are you lazy about serving God? Are you slothful in serving God? If you're tired, do you serve God? Do you put effort and time and energy? Or are you lazy in your service for God? So if you're going to serve God with sincerity and in truth, then you can't serve God, the Bible says, in slothful in business. The greatest business you have is serving God. That's your greatest business in serving God. If you serve any other area of your life more than your business of serving God, then your life, our lives are out of balance. We're out of whack. And so we got to serve with a, a fervency, or with, a, with a, 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 the Bible says, not slothful in bed. Look at the next word, fervent. Not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit. Uh, notice it's a little s. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit's power in your life, though we need the power of God in our lives. It's my spirit. It's my attitude. Uh, it's my, my motivation, my passion. The word fervent means to boil. So Paul's describing a holy passion for God and for the purpose of God. That was his eternal value. Paul isn't describing someone who needs to be arm-twisted into volunteering to do something around the church to serve God and finally gets pressured in, finally feels guilty and says, all right, I'll serve. He's looking for someone that says he's fervent in spirit. If anything, He's so much wanting to be involved in everything, he needs to be counseled in know, not knowing that, or knowing that he can't do everything effectively and successfully. He's got to pick and choose what areas of ministry he can be involved in. It's getting him in the proper perspective of serving God. And so rather than describing uh, those who are boiling over with zeal to the point that probably they need uh, to be uh, counseled and know what to do for God, you say, but preacher, I'm not a type A a personality. That's not me. Now, I'm more of an introvert. I'm more uh, laid back. And listen, uh, all of us are excited about something. All of us, I don't care what your personality type is, you get passionate about something. Something. And so God's not talking about a, a type A personality. It's every personality. Every person is to be fervent in spirit. So you got to be not slothful in your service for God business. Fervent in spirit. And then he goes on to say what? Serving the Lord. Paul wrote to this entire church at Rome. He wasn't writing right, just to the pastors or the leaders in the church. All Christians are full-time Christians in serving God. All Christians are full-time Christians. What's that mean? Full-time Christians everywhere, whatever you do, whenever you're doing it, is serving God. Full-time is not what you do around the church. Full-time is all of us serving God everywhere. It's in your home, full-time Christian. Full-time Christian, uh, what you watch on TV, what you listen to on the radio, uh, what you talk about in conversation, places you go, things you do, things you're involved in, things you listen to. Listen, we're a full-time Christian. And God says that's the kind of Christian serving the Lord 
all of us serving God. And so we bring our spiritual gifts, the talents that God gives all of us that we contribute to the body of Christ. We all have natural talents, but when you got saved, God gave you a spiritual gift. And some of, some of you have a primary spiritual gift and, and several other spiritual gifts that complement that spiritual gift. And so you have talent is one thing. A uh, spiritual gift is something totally different. Talents are given usually through uh, your heritage. You know, your, your mom was this way, and so she taught you this, or your dad was this way, and he taught you what he knew over here and things. But spiritual gift is what God imparts to you when you got saved. And then as you use that gift, it grows. It strengthens. Uh, it's able to impact and influence more people. And if you're saved today, you have a spiritual gift. Do you know what it is? That would be something, you know what your strengths are, you know what your talents are, you know what your abilities are. If you're putting out a job application, you say, no, I can't do that. That's way over my head, and I don't understand that. Uh, that's beyond my comprehension. So you know what your skill set can do. Do you know what your spiritual skill set or spiritual gifts are? And, and so there's no such thing as a non-serving member within the body of Christ. Uh, everyone uh, has been given a spiritual gift. And if you're not serving, then ask the Lord to show you what your spiritual gift is and, and begin to plug in. Now, you may try one area, and it may not be a good fit. You may try something else, a certain age group, and it may not be a good fit for you. You may try something else, and it may not. And then finally you'll find the fit that works for your spiritual gift. And it's just like playing sports. Uh, you, you know, not everyone's going to play first base. Not everyone is, is equipped to play, talented to play outfield or certain talent skills. Not everyone can be an infielder. Not everyone can be a catcher. Uh, not, you know, so everyone, and so you might start off catching, but it just doesn't fit you. You'd start off, go out to third base, and it just doesn't fit you. And then finally, you find, your, you find your niche. And the same thing spiritually. And so don't get discouraged. If something's not a good fit for you, it's just sort of you're not getting fulfillment and enjoyment, uh, when you're doing your spiritual spiritual gift, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. And uh, it's not going to be a drudgery. It's not going to be, oh, boy, i got to go do this. You're gonna be excited about it. And, and so if you're not enjoying what you're doing, and uh, you're right with God, you're serving God, all these other areas, and, and you're not enjoying it, that just may not be a good fit for you. And maybe you need to be plugged into another different area, maybe a different age group or a different uh, area of ministry around the church. And so serving the Lord, serving the Lord uh, and uh, as a full-time Christian all the long time. See, there's a difference between a slave and a volunteer. Now, before you get all offended, we're all, if you're a Christian, we're all slaves, bought from the slave market of sin, condemned to hell, and, and we're, we're a slave. There's nothing wrong with being a slave if you've got a great master. Uh, they had something in the Bible called a bond servant. A bond servant, yeah, there's a certain period of time that you were allowed to, that, that if you had a slave in Bible times, that they can only work so many years. At the end of that time that was served, the master of that slave or the, or the slaves uh, would have to release the, uh, the slave. And they were, they were set free and they would do whatever they would do. Uh, and, but sometimes, many times, uh, those slaves would say, we don't want to leave. We're raising our family here. We, we've got a nice home. You provide for us. And so the owner of those slaves uh, would be liable for, for overworking them beyond the, the given. I think it was six years, maybe seven years, that they were to work there. And, and so what they would do is that slave would come, and uh, he would lay his head on, on, a, on a log, and that master would, would take a, uh, an awl and uh, would hammer or pierce a hole, a large hole, into his earlobe to identify him as a bond servant, meaning he's a servant or a slave by choice, not by a have to. He's there because he wants to, not because he has to. Now, some of you are here tonight because you have to be here. Your wife drug you to church. Amen, Brother Smith? He, she drug you. You have to be here. If you're going to be fed this week, if you're going to uh, have a place to sleep this week, uh, you're gonna, if your, your laundry is going to be done, you have to come to church tonight. All right, but some of us, Brother Payton, you want to be here, right? Amen. And, uh, and uh, so we want to be here or we have to. So the bond servant says, I want to keep being your slave. Now, wait a minute. When I got saved, I was bought with a price. I was bought with a price, and he auctioned me off for God so loved you and me that he bought us. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. And so now I don't want to serve God because I have to. 
I want to serve God because I want to. I want to come to church because I want to, not because I have to. I want to go soul winning because I want to, not because I have to. I want to read my Bible because I want to, not because I have to. I want to live for God because I want to, not because I have to. I want to pastor Lighthouse Baptist Church because I want to, not because I have to. I want to serve God because I want to. And I want you to want to serve God and not to have to. So volunteers choose when and how they serve. Slaves are on call day and night whether they feel like serving or not. Volunteers can quit serving if they get tired. Slaves are servants for life. The master may change their duties, but they aren't free to quit. Volunteers have certain expectations. They expect to be treated with, uh, with respect. They expect proper working conditions and consideration for their needs. They expect to be honored for their service, but slaves don't have any expectations at all. They're just honored to serve a worthy God and that God would allow me to serve him. So we're not really looking for volunteers uh, come this year to serve God. We're looking for those that are slaves that says, I'm indebted to my Savior. And I'm not doing this because I have to. I'm a bond servant. And when you read through the different New Testament books, they, the, the introduction, uh, Paul says, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. He said, I'm a servant by choice. I'm not a servant because I have to be a servant. I'm a servant by choice. I hope you and I uh, will serve together on that capacity. And then lastly, back in Joshua, he says, all right. He said, I want you to fear the Lord. I want you to serve in sincerity and in truth. And then look what he says. Now, before you choose to serve God, he said, I want you to put away the gods on the other side. I want you to put away the gods on the other side. God wants you and I to serve him exclusively. Exclusively. He's the only one that we jump for. He's the only one uh, that we serve. Exodus 20 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In writing the uh, Christians uh, in 1 John, John says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. We cannot divide our allegiance between God. The Bible says, A friend of the world, an enemy of God. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that the friendship of the world you're an enemy of God. Either be a friend of the world, an enemy of God, or a friend of the world, God, an enemy of the world. But you can't walk the straddle and try to befriend both on both sides. That's why as you try to live your Christian life, the closer you get to God, just let me just help you a little bit here. The closer you get to God, you're going to have to let go of some of those that don't want to get as close to God as you do. You're going to have to walk on. You have to walk on. I preached a message years ago about the, the different uh, circles, the 5,000 and, and then the, uh, the 120 and then the, you know, the 40, you know, all the way down, the, all the way down to the 12 and then the 3. And, uh, you know, the closer you get to God, the less people want to be there. The less people are going to want to be there. That's, that's just a fact that Scripture identifies with. If you want everybody to be around you, then you're going to allow everyone else to determine how close you get to God. You've got to decide right now, here and foremost, that I'm going to get close to God no matter who may or may not want to go with me to get close to God. I hope your spouse wants to go close to God with you. I hope your children want to follow and get close to God. I hope others in our church family want to serve and get closer to God. But Joshua said, but for but you choose you what you're going to do. But he says, I've decided whether you go or not, I've chosen to follow God. I've chosen to fear God, to serve Him in sincerity. I've chosen to, uh, to get close to God and to walk with God and to get rid of those idols and those gods and to put away the gods. Jesus says, you, no man can serve two masters. For either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The mammon are the things that make up this world. Too many Christians are forfeiting their, right, their ability to serve God because you've chosen to serve the dollar. You've chosen to serve material things. You've made the choice. That's your choice. Your life revolves around this. I understand you need this to pay bills. I understand we need this to, to put food on. I understand we've got to have this. But it's the love of this that's the root of all evil. And so God says you can't serve two masters. 
uh, you better make sure that that money you're making uh, is under the rulership and the authority of God. Make sure the talents and abilities you have is under the rulership and the authority of God. And so the Israelites were first warned not to serve what? The gods which their fathers served. Let me just, let me just help you here. Just because mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and great-great-grandma did, did it doesn't mean you're obligated to do it. Just because your heritage believed a certain way doesn't mean you're obligated to believe that certain way. Just because that's the way they were raised and that's the way you were taught doesn't mean, he says, you better make a choice here and leave the gods that what? Your father served. Bible says if you don't hate father and mother more than me, then you're not fit for the kingdom of God. And again, he's not talking about a hatred towards them. He's talking about a love so great for God that in comparison for the love you have for family, it appears to be like hatred because you're so much passionate in serving God, your love for God. And so he says, I want you to put away those gods. Well, my dad always did this. My grandpa, we always believed this. And grandma and grandpa, we've always lived this way. But if it's not God's way, you got to put away the gods of your father. You gotta put away the gods uh, of your heritage uh, that's in the back. And if it's not God, too many people uh, cling to old religion, uh, religious belief uh, and practices because, not old time religion, but they cling to the old religious beliefs and practices because their parents and grandparents have believed and practiced them. You must be willing to do right regardless of who in your family wants or doesn't want to do right. And there's many of you that have made that choice. You've made that choice. And uh, you were maybe saved as a teenager and uh, raised in a home where they didn't want to serve God. But you said, I'm going to serve in God. And uh, we've had so many over the years that said, I'm just going to do right. I'm just going to do right. And uh, you've had others that don't understand why you do what you do and why you live the way you live. And, and you've had some strained relationship in some of your family because you're trying to serve God. And it doesn't mean you have to be unkind. It doesn't mean you have to be ungracious. Uh, but you've got, you're obligated to God. I'm obligated to God to realize if I'm going to choose to serve God, I've got to put away the old gods, the false gods, the strange gods on the other side. We must serve God even if our family doesn't serve God. I hope my wife keeps serving God. I hope my kids keep serving God. But I don't know if they will or not. But I can't let what they do with God determine what I do with God. I hope I keep serving God. I hope you keep serving God. But I hope me not continuing to serve God doesn't stop you from serving God. Because you've chosen to serve God, irregardless of who serves God or who doesn't serve God. There's some in your family, close family members that you have, and you've had to continue on to serve God. And you've had to say goodbye in some areas of the relationship. Not that you're uh, not in contact and not that you're not a part of their family, but you've had to move forward because they don't want to get as close to God as you want to get close to God. They don't want to be as near God as you want to be near God and you walk on. They're not uh, uh, able to move forward uh, with us. God says don't be unequally yoked together. God wants us to exclusively love him. And I'm done. Joshua chose, challenged the people. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But it wasn't enough just to simply make the choice. Joshua wanted them to know what the choice entailed. So before you and I make the choice tonight, to serve God. It sounds good. It's, it's a life of blessings. It's a life of, of great uh, reward. God says to the people here, he says, here's the requirements. you got to fear the Lord. First and foremost, you got to fear the Lord. Number two, you got to serve the Lord with the right attitude and the right action. It's not just about doing the right thing. It's doing the right thing with the right heart in sincerity and in truth. And then he says, you got to, Serve the Lord, and you got to put away the old, strange, and, and bad gods and false gods and uh, the gods that were on the other side. Put them away. I don't know what gods are holding you back from serving God, but maybe now's the time. Today's the day to begin to realize if you're going to choose to serve God with your marriage, your home, your family, there's some gods you're going to have to put aside. There's some gods, gods you're going to have to leave behind. But notice in verse 16, go back to Joshua, and we're done. Let me show you how this story ends. See, it's neat how it ends down as we look at it. So um, appropriate to how we deal in our own lives. But Joshua, again, go to chapter 24. And so the people spoke as, as, as making the choice to serve the Lord needs to be taken seriously. And uh, notice in verse uh, 16 of, of chapter uh, 24, and the people answered. So he says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. 
And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. By the way, they saw something that most Christians don't see. When you choose to serve something other than God, you forsake God. You walk away from God. And, uh, and you walk away from the blessings of God in your life. And the people said, no, uh, well, God forbid. Verse 17, for the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up. Boy, they begin to remember all the great things God had done in their lives and their past. He brought us up out of our fathers of the land of Egypt. For the house of bondage in which did those great signs in our sight. And preserved us in the way wherein we might uh, went. And, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwell in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for He is our God. Wow, they're pumped up, they're excited. Yes, count us in, Joshua. We're, he's our God. He's your God. He's our God. He did miracles for us, and He's going to do miracles. We're in. Count us in. But notice what Joshua does, a great leader that he was. Joshua now, go down to verse number 19, and Joshua said unto the people, you cannot serve God, serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then He will turn you and do you hurt and consume you after that He hath done you good. The people said, we want to go. We want to serve. Is Joshua trying to discourage the people? They just made a decision. He said, choose you this day. Yes, he's our God. It sounds like Joshua is trying to discourage the decision that they just made. But he's not trying to discourage the people from serving God. He's trying to impress upon them the serious nature of this commitment to serve God. This isn't a game with God. You want to you choose to serve God? Then it's, We're not playing around with this. God doesn't take this lightly. It's a real decision. And if you make this decision, children of Israel, to serve God, and you go back to those gods, and you don't deal with your sins, and you don't do the right thing, then God's going to take away those blessings. He says he's going to come and do what? He's going to do you hurt. He's going he's to chase you down. He's going to find where you're at. He's going to do you hurt and consume you. After that he hath done you good. God has been so good to you. And that's why he said the first thing you better understand, you better fear God. If you're going to last in serving God, it's going to be because you have a fear that God's going to hunt you down and consume you for you reneging and going back on your choice to serve God. Nobody twisted your arm and nobody sort of uh, finessed you into this army. He says, this is a requirement. If you're willing to take the challenge, challenge given, challenge accepted, then come on in. Let's make an impact for the cause of Christ. But if you're just sort of going through the motions, trying to impress people, trying to look good, trying to look spiritual, then God says, I'm not sure if you want to make this choice. I'm not really sure if you want to make this choice. Because this is a real serious choice. We don't hear messages like this. We hear the one verse, choose you this day, whom you'll serve. We don't hear the prerequisites, and we don't hear the consequences after we make the choice to serve, what God will do when you choose to walk away from God and serve other gods other than the choice you made to serve God. This is big league business. This is serious stuff, folks. And I want God to bless your life. And I want God to do something great in your life. And it will only come when you choose to serve God. But I want you to understand, before you make the choice to serve God, I want you to understand what the prerequisites are. I want you to understand what the consequences are when you don't follow through with the prerequisites. It's really serious. Because you're not just talking about what you're wanting to do. You're talking about impacting the lives of others. Making a difference in the lives of others. Are you willing to pay the price and the cost? Thank you, Father, for tonight. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take the moments that we've had, Lord, with the Word of God. And you say, choose you this day whom you'll serve. And the people said, we're serving God. And Joshua said, that's great. But it's easy to say, I'm going to serve God. I just want you to understand something. There's a cost in serving God. And if you choose not to follow through with your choice to follow and obey God, then God tells us He's going to hunt us down. He's going to consume us. 
because of all the good that he's done for us. And we've used that good for our own selfishness. We've used the blessings of God for our own benefit and comfort and convenience. We've used all of God's uh, blessings on our lives for our own self-consumption. And God's, I'm going to hunt you down and consume you. That's a serious thought that we maybe need to reflect upon before we make the choice to choose you this day whom you're going to serve. There's no other choice worth serving because if we don't choose to serve God, then we serve Satan. We serve the flesh. We serve our own appetites. We serve our own emotions and our own will, and that always leads to heartache and to ruin. And Father, that's why it's so important that we need to understand how much you love us and what a loving master and a loving Savior. And Lord, give us Christians that want to be a bondservant to you, that, that, that are a slave to you by choice, not because they have to. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed. The piano plays. Let's all stand tonight. We've had a great day today as we celebrate the greatness of God. And a great God demands a great commitment on our part to choose to serve God. It starts off with a fear of God. Fear of God always is connected to obedience. The extent that you obey God is the extent that we're fearing God. Fear God, keep His commandments, for there's the, the whole duty of man. It summarizes it all. And then it says, I want you to serve me with the right attitude and the right actions, sincerity and in truth. Don't you decide how I want to be served. I've told you how I want to be served. I want you to be a holy people, godly, set apart. I want you to live a life of righteousness. And holy, I've told you how and what you do to serve me in truth. I've told you what I want you to do to serve me. Don't you tell me how I want to be served. They say, I want you to have the right attitude. Maybe you're doing the right actions, but you don't have the right attitude. Maybe tonight you say, dear God, I'm so sorry. I've not been serving in sincerity. I've been trying to impress people but not impress you. I've been trying to pacify others and not please you. Lord, help me to serve you with a right spirit, a right heart, a right attitude. And then help me to put away those gods, those old false gods that are holding me back. They're preventing me from solely, exclusively serving God. You know what they are. I know what mine are. You know what yours are. God says, I want you to make a choice through Joshua. Choose you this day. Count me in, preacher. That's all good. That's all good. But I'd rather you put a pause and really think through the seriousness of the decision you're about to make. Before you jump in and do something, you're going to regret. Because you did it to impress someone. You did it with the wrong reason behind it. Father, it's an amazing privilege that you allow us to serve you. That you would even allow us a choice that we can make to serve you. You won't force any of us to do right, but you want us to, do, to choose right. You won't force any of us. You won't manhandle any of us to serve you, but you, you would like us to choose to serve you. You won't make us do anything. You won't make us live a righteous and a holy and a godly life. You won't make us put away the gods on the other side. You won't, you won't make us do that, but you want us to choose to do that. He wants to choose to do that. Lord, help us to make the choice rightly and quickly for your purpose and plan. In Jesus' name.